Uh, welcome, thank you for joining us. Uh, please do introduce yourselves in the chat, um, who you are, where you're from, and we're just about to get started. Okay, well, welcome um, as, as people join us. Um, welcome to Sunday morning of uh, Friends for Life UK 2020. Thank you ever so much for uh, joining us. Um, some of you have been uh, with us since Thursday evening. Some of you I know have just joined over the weekend. I um, uh, hope you're all doing well and thank you. Um, so this session this morning is uh, with uh, Professor Rory McCrimmon on uh, hypos. I hope that was the link that you were expecting to click on. Um, even if it wasn't, I was just you stay here because I think this is going to be a really um, important and good talk for us um, as parents and carers um, of uh, young people with uh, type 1 diabetes, um, a topic which um, we've all, I'm sure, been really focused on and thinking about ever since first diagnosis. I know that, that I have. Um, so uh, please do use the chat to introduce yourselves and uh, say hello who you are thank you for those of you that are doing that from around the country um, also please use the chat um, to uh, to chat to, to, to comment as, as we go along please keep those those comments respectful uh, and then next to the chat box you'll see a Q&A box so um, after uh, Rory has spoken uh, we'll have a time for q and I'll uh, keep an eye on that box and feed your questions um, uh, to our speaker and I've grouped them together where there's similar ones but please do use the Q&A box as well. So um, it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning. Uh, Rory McCrimmon is Dean of the Medical School at uh, University of Dundee and they're a professor of experimental diabetes and metabolism. Um, uh, with a particular research interest over the years in our topic today. So um, probably the person in the UK to, to lead this session, Rory, we're very grateful indeed for you uh, giving up part of your Sunday morning to um, inform and educate us as parents on hypoglycemia and uh, over to you. Great, thanks very much, Chris. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. It is a, a rather dreary Sunday morning, but I, so I guess time where we can have this type of chat and conversation. So in the talk today, and I aim to talk for maybe 20, 25 minutes at most so that we can have a lot of time for discussion. And a lot of the panel sessions like this I've done in the past, I think some of the uh, questions bring out the more interesting topics. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about hypoglycemia, why it happens and, and why people develop a condition we call impaired awareness of hypoglycemia. And then what might happen to those people who've got a problem with hypoglycemia, want to address it and come into the clinic. And the sort of approaches that we use to try and improve awareness and, and certainly avoid severe hypoglycemia, which is something that I mean, obviously, obviously us have major concerns about. So I'm just going to flick now through these slides. And of course, uh, this is a very, uh, the penultimate year, 19, 2021 sees the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin and you will got next year in particular I think there are going to be a huge number of presentations and talks. Um, I'm, I'm for instance giving a talk in Toronto which is a um, where insulin was of course first manufactured and discovered and where there's a huge um, international symposium related to or all about the discovery of insulin and Scotland has a hand in this of course because JGR Cloud, originally from Aberdeen, uh, was part of the group that uh, discovered insulin. And he, working along with Banting, were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1923. So insulin discovered 1921, first manufactured in 1922, um, and then in 1923, Best got the award. Now, there were, like anything else in science, it comes out of teamwork. And there was McLeod and Collip, who was a biochemist that not many people know about, 
and of course Banting and Best. Um, and then as with all scientists who make a great invention, they all fell out afterwards and ended up in rival groups, each claiming um, they had the biggest um, uh, role to play in the discovery of insulin. But the real, the real winners were Lilly, who bought the patent for 50 cents and then managed to make it. And uh, then we are where we are. Insulin has gone through an incredible evolution ever since. And this is the type of comment you saw at the time uh, from Elizabeth Hughes talking about how she might move towards having a normal existence because prior to the discovery of insulin, of course, the only approach that we had to try and treat uh, type 1 diabetes was with diet, cabbage diet, or, or going to be in Italy in the hills for a while, hoping your constitution might make you better. And so this was a transformative therapy. But it wasn't actually quite so straightforward. Um, Elliot Joslin, who founded the Joslin Clinics in America, which are really famous for their management of diabetes, recognized that although we had insulin, things were not quite yet solved. And what Joslin was referring to um, was the fact of hypoglycemia, the fact that too much insulin can drive blood sugars down and cause this symptom complex that you all recognize as a low or hypoglycemia. And this was described here in 1923. Remember, we first manufactured insulin in 1922. And very soon afterwards, people became aware of what used to be called the hypoglycemic reaction. Um, this description by Banting, the complaint of hunger, weakness, fatigue, anxiety, nervousness, I think most people would recognize as the experience of hypoglycemia. Of course, that experience changes based upon your age. In children, it is less the experience, perhaps, than what parents recognize in their child, the child who's pale or the child who is sweating and the child needs help or behavior has changed, um, which might indicate hypoglycemia. And similarly, in the elderly, it's a very different symptom complex. We also very quickly recognize that that symptom complex appeared to change over time. The symptoms someone experiences in the first few years of their diabetes is very different to the symptoms experienced after 10 years. Reactions that differ so much from the original ones that people become dangerously unaware of their onset. And this is a condition that we now describe not as hypoglycemia unawareness, because true un unawareness is really quite rare, but impaired awareness. So that's the symptoms of change. So it's less sweating, profusion, or more towards confusion, or knowing something is wrong, but not quite knowing what it was. And that can vary depending on your activity or what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It's remarkably variable, even in with the one individual over time. So I'm gonna show you, because once we discovered that there was a, a lot of physiological studies, and, and I think it, it's useful to understand a little bit about the physiology to know why it happens and why it happens so commonly in type 1 diabetes compared to those without diabetes where hypoglycemia is very rare. It occurs in very few circumstances, prolonged starvation, pregnancy, um, sometimes related to, um, to, to fasting, but otherwise we don't see them often. So in this study, which was done by a woman called Stephanie Amell from King's College, um, London, she took people in to the lab and she infused them into the vein with insulin and she gave it a fixed dose. Now, if you take people who at that time were on conventional therapy, now these were patients from a trial, a very famous trial called the Diabetes Care and Complications Trial. And this trial was done in America in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, because at that time, most people with type one diabetes were treated with one daily insulin. And they recognized that this wasn't good enough and they had to approve it. So they wanted to compare conventional, once daily or twice daily insulin with intensive therapy, which was multiple injections or an insulin pump. So if you gave this infusion to people on conventional therapy, HbA1c sort of middling around about 8% in the old money, then their glucose levels, as you'd see in this orange uh, dotted graph, would drop and their plateau ran about 3.6. But they would sit at that level. They wouldn't come up, they wouldn't go down, they would sit about, about that level. And that's a balance between the, ins the glucose lowering effect of insulin and the counter regulatory response, pushing your glucose back up again. Now, if you took people on intensive therapy, these were people on pumps or multiple injections their glucose levels dropped far lower. Now their HbA1c had dropped to around about 7%, you know, around about 53, 54 millimoles per mole. 
their glucose levels dropped far further and stayed lower. And it wasn't just the glucose levels, their hormone responses were less and their symptom responses were less at that time. Now to help you with this, I'm gonna show you what would happen if I gave the same insulin infusion to someone without diabetes. Now this is what would happen. Initially with a high dose of insulin, their glucose levels, their sugar levels would fall down to within the no low normal range. And then their defense mechanisms would kick in and their sugar would now be pushed back up towards the mid normal or the high normal range. It was called a counter regulatory defense response. And that as you can see is very different from either conventionally treated or intensively treated type 1 diabetes. There's a lot of research into this area over the years, and we now know that the reason for this first difference, the difference between people without and people with type 1 diabetes, is because the failure to shut off insulin. What I mean by that is I, I do not have diabetes. If I gave myself some insulin and my sugar levels would drop, my body would stop producing its own insulin. My beta cells would shut off because they don't want to produce insulin because my sugar levels are low. If you've got insulin that's from being released from a pump or sitting under the skin in a pool following injection, well, you can't shut that off. It continues to drive. So it's a failure to shut off insulin is the first defect. The second problem, and I really, I'd say a fascinating one, but a, a really important one, is the lack of glucagon. So people with type 1 diabetes within the first five years of diagnosis, less than children, cannot produce glucagon in response to hypoglycemia. Now, we all know glucagon is important. If you've had a severe hypo, people might give you an injection of glucagon. It's the major hormone that drives the liver to produce sugar and acts against insulin to drive your sugar levels up. And people with type 1 diabetes have glucagon in their pancreas. They can release it to lots of other stimuli, but they cannot release it to hypoglycemia specifically. And this profound defect, which is why hypoglycemia is more common in type 1 diabetes. Now, the second defect we see here between those who are tightly controlled and those whose control is less so good relates to recurrent exposure to hypoglycemia. And I'll tell you a little bit about that later on, but effectively, the more often you're hypo, the bigger your risk of having a more severe hypo down the line. And it's so hypoglycemia appears to drive this condition that we call impaired awareness. And we can talk about that a bit later. Now, how big is the problem? Well, in general, severe hypoglycemia, thankfully, is not that common. And it affects us about 20% of the people with type 1 diabetes have lots of hypos, as severe hypos. And severe hypo meets the need for external assistance or the need for glucagon or the need for intravenous glucose. So it's severe. It's clearly affected your ability to look after yourself. And that's on average about one per patient per year on average, but most of that within about 20%. What has become clear is we used to know that symptomatic less severe hypoglycemia happened about two times per week on average. But with flash glucose monitoring, with continuous glucose monitoring, we actually know that about 75% of all episodes of hypo are not recognized. They're so-called silent. Um, and that's something that we need to look at. And it may be why some of the outcomes from the trials with continuous glucose monitoring have not been as good as we thought they would be. I'm going to show you an example. So these, and I know many of you now are familiar with these type of traces because you've seen either flash glucose monitoring or continuous glucose monitoring. And these are these little devices that sit under the skin and they sample your glucose every 15 minutes. And I've got three profiles here, which you can see. And each of these individuals did not know they were experiencing hypoglycemia. And what you can see in every case, particularly over the night, there was lots of times when the glucose level was low and stayed low for quite a long period, but also in the afternoon as well. And interestingly enough, look at these HbA1Cs. I mean, 84, 63, not HbA1Cs that you'd automatically think of. And in fact, in large population studies, there is no link between HbA1C, your level of control, and hypoglycemia. So I think it's much more common than we think. And this to help you recognize, so this is, look at that variability. The green bar there in each of these figures is the range that is seen in people without 
diabetes, right? That we would expect sugar levels to move between. Now you can see the fluctuation in this pictures. So this is mine. This is when I wore um, a continuous glucose monitor for a week and I do not have diabetes. And what you can see is it's flat. It hardly changes because sugar is so important to the body. Glucose is this major, major fuel. So you can see the difficulties that there are in managing glucose because of these profound problems within the physiology. There's not much you can do about it because it relates to the condition itself. So a lot of research followed on from those initial clamp studies. And the question being asked was where and how do we sense glucose? Now, I won't go into this in any detail, but suffice to say that most of it is in the brain. We've got, we've got glucose sensors in different parts of the body, but mostly they're in the brain because the brain is about 2% of the body's size, but takes 20% of its energy, more so in kids. It's about 40 to 50% in kids. And the brain has no fuel stores. So the major stores you might have heard about are, of course, fat and glycogen and muscle, and the brain has very little of either of these. So the brain needs glucose and it needs a constant supply of glucose. And if it doesn't get it, it doesn't work so well. It can use alternate fuels, which is an interesting debate. So it probably can use ketone bodies and it probably can use uh, so-called medium chain fatty acids. Um, but most of the time it uses glucose and there's reasons we've evolved to want to use glucose. So to defend that high demand is why we have all these really complex physiological systems, all of which are designed to make sure that the brain gets glucose all the time. And within the brain, we have these very specialized neurons. Now these are neurons are cells that are like nerve cells, but they are able to detect glucose and they change their firing rate in response to the glucose concentration. So they're the ones that then regulate the whole body system in response to changing glucose. Now, why do we then develop impaired awareness over time if we've got this incredibly well-regulated system? Well, part of it is because, as I said, because of this lack of glucagon, and the high levels of insulin, but also because our body adapts to recurrent hypoglycemia. Now, again, I'm not going to go through all the different mechanisms, but some work that really came out of our lab here in Dundee a number of years ago, based upon this creature, um, this is uh, aplasia, uh, which is also known as the sea slug. Uh, California aplasia is a much nicer name than the sea slug. And it's a model of something called habituation. And basically, if you take the sea slug and you flip it upside down, it has what's called a friable mantle. And in the old studies of habituation, they would take a little stick and prod it, and the mantle would withdraw. But as you, and so every time you prod it, it withdraws. But the more times you prod it, eventually it just stops withdrawing, it adapts. And this is the model we think happens with recurrent hypoglycemia. If you think about it, what is hypoglycemia? Because we've only had insulin 100 years, but we've had glucose as a fuel for millions of years. So glucose, low glucose, signals to the body starvation. And the body learns to adapt to starvation. Various processes happen inside it. So it learns to adapt over time. It, it's a form of memory, if you like. Um, and, the, and as I said, we just adapt to these changes. And again, I can talk about other mechanisms later on. So effectively what happens is our thresholds change. So if you take here in the black line, as this is what would happen in someone without diabetes. As your glucose levels fall, more and more of these specialized neurons are recruited and you get a bigger and bigger counteracted response until you get a maximum response. After recurrent hypoglycemia, this response shifts to the left. What that means is that you don't get that max response to a lower and lower glucose. You still have the maximal response, but below BO2, there's nothing much you can do about it because your sugar levels are so low, you're not thinking properly. But it's shifted to the left. On the other hand, particularly in people with type 2 diabetes, where we see long-term exposure to high glucose, it actually shifts to the right. So someone with type 2 diabetes can have a hypoglycemic response at glucose levels of 6 or 7. Now, I'm often asked, why, why then do we habituate? What is the purpose of this when it makes us more at risk of severe hypoglycemia? And the reason for this, I think, is because of this unphysiological context of hypoglycemia. So starvation is a low insulin state, and also the body is producing glucagon. In type 1 diabetes, hypoglycemia occurs with high levels of insulin and no glucagon, and that just pushes your sugar levels down. And once you get below two, 
unfortunately, you, then you're so impaired, you're not able to think properly, that you, even if you're having a response, even if you're pale and sweating and tachycardia, you don't know it, and you end up having a severe hyper. And that's what happens. So how do we address this problem um, in the clinic? If someone comes to me with a severe hypo or with reduced awareness of hypoglycemia or recurrent hypoglycemia, well, we have a variety of approaches, and, and I hope you've seen these in your own clinics as well when, when you've gone along. Um, education, by far and away, the most important. Getting insulin right is the next one. People have got into very, very bad habits often with their insulin, take far too much insulin at the wrong times, um, and that's something we look at. And we also talk about hypoglycemia avoidance strategies and carbohydrate counting, etc. We look at the type of insulin people are taking with the newer analogs that are now available, we think about pumps, uh, we think about flash glucose monitoring, we think about artificial pancreas eventually, um, and, and ultimately for very, very severe disease, we think about pancreas transplantation. Well, that, that's unusual. I've, I've not referred anyone for years for pancreas transplantation. I think there's a lot we can do before we get to that point. I'm going to show you some of the things that we pick out. So one question I'm often asked, uh, usually unfortunately by healthcare professionals, is, well, is a, is a high sugar in the morning a sign of a low sugar at night, or so-called rebound hypoglycemia or the smoji effect? And the answer is no. Um, I think it's been really well looked at. And the biggest marker of a low sugar at night is a low sugar in the morning. Of course, now more of us have flash glucose monitoring or continuous glucose monitoring. This is less of an issue, but the smoji effect doesn't really occur. Now, some people can have a pronounced rise in sugar in the morning. This is a so-called morning effect. That's to do with increases in your natural steroids, and that's a very difficult thing to address, but it's different from a rebound hypoglycemia. The other thing, of course, we talk about is alcohol because alcohol suppresses the liver and stops it producing um, glucose, um, mainly when you're fasted, funnily enough, not when you're fed. So you are a much higher risk of hypoglycemia after um, alcohol, but if you've eaten, it's less so. So again, advice we give about small amounts of alcohol, make sure you're eating at the same time. And of course, make sure your friends are aware. The other big thing um, is exercise, of course, uh, particularly with kids. Um, we talk a little bit about the double hit of hypoglycemia, the risk of hypoglycemia during exercise and how to minimize that. And again, that can come up in the discussion um, and hypoglycemia through the night after exercise. And a useful thing to think about is the insulin on board idea. Okay, so if we take this picture of someone exercising after a meal who's taken their short acting insulin, and that's that blue curve that you can see. And you can see the green line is at about two hours. If you exercise within two hours of eating, clearly you've got high levels of insulin on board, so you're at a risk of hypoglycemia. So what might you do to reduce that risk? Well, one thing, of course, is to exercise four hours after eating or first thing in the morning before your breakfast, because then you've got very low levels of insulin on board and your risk of hypoglycemia is really quite low. Um, you might still want to mitigate it, but it's low. The other thing, of course, that you should do is reduce your insulin. If you know you're going to exercise within two hours of eating, you should be reducing your mealtime insulin by anything from 25 to 75%, depending on how much exercise you're about to do. And you, you have to individualize that because everyone is different. But I think it's something that should be considered and should be talked about. And there's lots of other things to talk about, which, again, we can pick up in Q&A. The other thing we try and address is the so-called um, over-ambitious attitude. Now, we tend to see this um, mostly in adults. I don't know whether it's something you also get in the kids, but effectively, these are people who bowl us every time we get to 10. They overcorrect, And you see this classical picture with multiple small doses. And what that leads to is sugar levels going up and down through the day with hypoglycemia. And I understand that. This is fear of hyperglycemia and fear of the complications of hypoglycemia. And it's a very, very difficult behavior to treat, but it's dangerous because it leads to insulin stacking and it leads to hypoglycemia. And we know that. So this is on your left is that sort of person who is doing um, a lot of bonusing. They end up with these Himalaya type pictures, lots of peaks, lots of troughs, high levels and low levels, that is associated with a much higher risk of hypoglycemia and actually a much higher risk of complications down the line. So what we're trying to move is to the figure on your right, where your glucose variability is lower, where you have more time in range, uh, and that's something that we need to work at in an educational setting. 
And what are we trying to avoid? Well, we're trying to avoid so-called level three, which is severe hypoglycemia, and we're also trying to avoid level two, which is it's less than three. At the moment, less than three seems to be a figure of time in which we know that, that you're not able to think quite so clearly and possibly is associated with longer term complications. So that's one that we definitely want to avoid. And alert values come at certainly less than uh, four, sometimes higher, depending on the person. So this is a sort of summary of all the educational um, programs that are out there. Most of you will have come across Daphne and Tim as alternatives, and I think these are critical. I think carb counting, although I think we can probably address, but it's probably a bit too much focus on carbs at the expense of other meals, because all you know, fat and protein will all eventually be converted into glucose, um, and probably a bit too much focus on that at the expense of your background insulin, but they're important. There are also a number of other very specific educational programs around hypoglycemia, such as HypoCompass or blood glucose awareness training. Um, and more recently, Daphne Hart, run from King's College, that we, we hope to bring in, because I think there are aspects of specific training that we need to address, but all treat hypoglycemia avoidance. We have technology. Uh, the first thing that came in was, of course, glucose meters with built-in automatic bolus calculators. Well, the evidence is they are. Um, maths literacy is not necessarily fantastic. If you look at this figure here in the little red box, if you allow people to calculate their own dose of short acting insulin based upon the carbohydrate content of the meal, they get it right about 60% of the time. Whereas if you use a bolus calculator, it's 94%. So bolus calculators in general work. This is a table showing you some of the large randomized clinical trials that have looked at the newer insulin. And I'm just going to talk about your so-called basal, your background insulin. I'm going to be pretty clear. You need to be, if you're going to be injecting, you need to be on either Degvidec, Traceba, or Glygene U300, Togeo. They're far, far better. Much lower incidence of nighttime hypoglycemia. I don't think we should be using other insulins, certainly not for people with type 1 diabetes. And this is why. So this is, uh, if you look here in the brown, this is the old NPH insulin. In the purple is Glargine U100, so that's Lantus. And then there in the green is insulin Detamir. And these were the first generation background analogs. This is the, each one is one person injecting four times, same dose and four different dose days. And what you can see is that they all vary. Same dose, same meal content, and they vary, and there's lots of reasons for that variability, but you can see the MPH is much more variable in its effects than either the Lantus or the Detamir. And the newer instances, the Tegeos and the Degladex, Traceba and Tege are much better than that at all. So you reduce variability with the newer analogs and that makes you less likely to have hypo. Then there's the debate about pumps versus uh, multiple injections. Uh, the literature actually is pretty mixed on this. Um, and I'm, most of you, if this is an audience larger with kids, you'll mostly be using people on pumps. Actually, um, randomized controlled trials comparing pumps versus multiple injections, so no difference. Um, so I think it's down to the individual. It's down to what that individual wants. I mean, my bias is, is for a pump because I think you do have more control, particularly at night, and because it opens up the newer technologies like closed loops and continuous glucose monitoring. But evidence as this data will show you, is that there isn't much of a difference between the two. We're then coming in now with continuous glucose monitoring. Uh, again, real-time continuous glucose monitoring trials have shown they reduce the risk of severe hypoglycemia, probably because of the alarms, but they don't actually improve impaired awareness. Uh, that may be because the trials are too short. It may be because we recognize that these machines are not so accurate when you're hypo. So Dexcom G6, for instance, tends to underestimate your hypo. So the Dexcom G6 runs higher than your true glucose levels and you miss a lot of hypo. Whereas flash glucose monitoring, the Libra tends to go the other way where you tend to overestimate how often that you're hypoglycemic. Either way, I personally think they're fabulous technology. I think they improve quality of life in so many other ways and teach you so much about your diabetes that they are a technology I advocate for everybody, but I struggle to sometimes to be able to defend it with the health boards based upon the evidence um, that we have. But as I said to you before, what it does open up is the possibility of 
closed loops. And, and these people, people who have really big problems with nocturnal hypers, where about 50% of hypers occur, I think low glucose suspend, where obviously where you have a linked system and it, and it shuts off your pump when your glucose levels fall, they have been shown to be very effective in, in hospital studies. And then, of course, predictive low glucose suspend, where you can get them to shut the pump shuts off at a higher level to offer even greater protection. And then the pump restarts after a couple of hours, I think are very useful helps with treatment of diabetes and impaired awareness and nighttime, troubling nighttime hypos. And that's what we want to get rid of. And then finally, you'll have heard, um, I know Ed Diamano was giving a major talk about the bionic pancreas, and he'll have talked about the combination insulin and glucagon pancreases, but the closed loop systems, the artificial pancreas system, they are now in randomized uh, controlled trials. They are getting closer to more widespread use. And I'm hoping um, that they are going to mark a significant improvement. But what I would say is they still rely on um, a lot of intervention from the hospital and from the from people um, controlling the system is not truly hands off yet, um, and technology has limitations that we have to recognise. So it's not for everybody. And then finally, as I said to you, pancreas transplantation it works. So what's interesting, it takes eighteen months after pancreas transplantation to restore the normal hormonal responses to hypoglycemia. So it's something that's developed over many, many years and it doesn't reverse quickly. And I think that's important to know. Even if you've managed to avoid hypos for a period, it will take you a long time and continued hyper avoidance to begin to restore your full symptom awareness. And then there are novel areas. I talked to you about habituation as to uh, the reason why we develop it. Well, my, my lab's also been working on dishabituation. This is where you introduce a novel stimulus. I, I won't go into detail. We have a large trial, but we've been shown that high intensity exercise, funny enough, or, or cold exposure can at least temporarily restore your symptom and your hormonal responses to hypoglycemia. So who knows? We may be able to talk about how we might use exercise or physiology to begin to restore these responses over time as an adjunct, as an adjunct that is, to some of the technologies that I've just described. So in summary, it's all about hypoglycemia avoidance if you want to restore your impaired awareness. And we do that for a variety of ways, of which by far and away the most important is education. Education, 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 as they say. Talking about the factors that put you at risk of hypoglycemia, talking about how you might avoid hypoglycemia, figuring out what's the best insulin from you, whether it's by injection, whether it's by pump, reviewing your carbohydrate and other management, reviewing continuous glucose monitoring, looking at analogs, pumps, real-time CGM, low glucose suspend, predictive low glucose suspend, or more uh, severe measures like pancreas plant if you've got very disabling uh, hypoglycemia. In the future, I think cognitive behavioral therapies, the habit is something that requires often behavioral therapies to reset, and I think that will become more important. I really do think people become adapted to a certain way of behavior. Um, artificial pancreas, the combination pumps you've heard about, um, and different forms of therapies, which I won't go into detail now. So that's my talk. I hope I haven't droned on for too long, and Chris can now come in with a whole series of questions for me yeah not at all i mean certainly the, the feedback i've been getting on the on the on the chat is that it's been really helpful and um i think people have been really focused on what you've been saying thank you we, we do have a few questions both in the q a and ones that have come up from from the chat and some about um a, kind of cgm alarms some about yep. kind of the evolution of hypo unawareness with time from diagnosis and a few others so um can i start with just a really practical one someone who is who is on a on one of the more advanced pumps or closed loop system just asking a very simple question about a recommendation for for where to set the low alarm over overnight yeah i think that's a really good question and what i would suggest is that it's down to the individual it really is because we all vary and so you've got some obviously setting the alarm value at 3.9 but i think that's given that the these cgms are inaccurate so it depends as well on the cgm i think the dexcom in particular um, which uh, a lot of people use, and, and the en enlightened, I guess, is not going to be so different. They tend to underestimate the degree of hypoglycemia, and so I would be bringing that alarm level up. Um, if you think about your glucose control, 
Most of the benefit is in getting your HbA1c down to about 7.5% or something like that. And below that, there's, there's less evidence of a huge benefit and a big risk of hypoglycemia. So I tend to, in those individuals who've got really problematic hypoglycemia, I'd set that alarm higher, okay? I would be going up to 5, 5.5 at levels like that um, in order to alert them. And the problem, you've got to balance again, of course, because then if your alarm is going off all the time, it'll just irritate you, you'll switch it off. So, um, I think, you know, I'm really into, the, or, or I really believe you have to personalize the therapy. You have to look at yourself, what works for you, because if it's, if it's too much, you'll just stop using it. And if it's too little, you run into problems. So adjust it. And with time, find out what your level is and what a time and range that you are comfortable with is. Okay. So it's interesting what you just said, because it's linked to the next thing I was going to ask, which is about someone was bringing up questions about whether CGM alarms are actually changing behaviours. So you, you've spoken, I think, very eloquently about the benefits of CGM. Are there are there downsides in terms of hypo awareness that people get conditioned, I suppose, to list to, to, to alarms rather than to their own you know, awareness within themselves? If that makes sense. There are. I mean, and it depends on your perspective. So the um, the large trials that have been done on real-time CGM show that they do reduce severe hypoglycemia. So that in itself is important, of course, because severe hypoglycemia is awful and nobody wants to have that. So that's very valuable. But they don't improve awareness, which is interesting. And that would suggest that there's still a lot of hypoglycemia happening within that population. Now, the question is, of course, is, you know, when is that hypoglycemia um, dangerous? And I don't think we know the level at which we definitely need to avoid. We've, you know, through our part, something I'm part of called the International Hypoglycemia Study Group, we've obviously talked about three. But I do think that that is the, that is the risk, is you're conditioned to alarm. And, and certainly within the adult population, I'm afraid, um, a lot of people, a lot of people I look after just turn the alarms off, particularly at nighttime which sort of defeats the purpose. But so that's why I'm talking about the importance of balance because if it's going off all the time, you know, A, you're relying on the alarm and you're not changing your behavior. And yet clearly it's your behavior that is in some ways, sometimes out with your control, but it's where it's a useful period to think, well, why might it be going off my alarm? What is it that I am doing that is leading to this risk of hypoglycemia and trying to see whether you can um, improve that. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned there again about about the effects of hypo. So I think somewhere in your talk you alluded to the potential for long term negative yeah. effects of repeated hypos below three. Um, uh, somebody interested in what those might, you know, a bit more detail on what those effects might be. What is it that we ought to be worrying about? Well, first of all, <coughs> I think we have to establish. A value that is important. I think that the evidence is, is very, very low sugar is not good for you, and you're not going to be surprised by that. Very, very severe hypoglycemia can damage the tissues. The evidence that hypoglycemia itself, at say three, may call, have long term consequences came from trials in type 2 diabetes, where there was an increase in cardiovascular disease and in um, all cause mortality. And then there was a big debate as to whether chicken and egg was it just more frail people were more likely to have hypoglycemia and what caused it. But the problem, I think at least in an experimental condition, doesn't happen from the hypo. It happens during what's called recovery. So when you go from a glucose level of three to a glucose level of 11, because you've been hypo, so you grab the first thing you can get hold of, a bit of chocolate or whatever, and you bring your glucose up to 11, you think that's fantastic. Actually, that's very damaging for the cell because Glucose is unusual in that it, it continues to act. So once it gets above normal, it doesn't stop working. It continues to work and it continues to drive into what are called these, these cell, these parts of the cell called mitochondria. And those mitochondria produce free radicals and free radicals cause inflammation. So you get, so as I, I personally think that the period that is dangerous for the tissue and the major tissues appear to be affected are brain, heart, and kidney, that if you drive glucose levels up after your hypo, 11, 15, 16, 
that can cause localized inflammation. And that's the bit that we want to avoid. So a lot, but a lot of this is basic research because you can't do this study in a human. You can do it in, in um, different animal models, but you can't do it. And, that, and, and so you have to look at, there's a large consortium I'm involved in now called HypoResolve. And we're pulling data from over a million patients with type one and type two diabetes. And we're gonna look at that. We're gonna look and see whether this glucose variability that I was alluding to from going low to high, does it lead to more significant consequence down the line? Okay, okay. thank you. And someone had just a very simple follow-up question, I think, which is, it's, it seems obvious to us that um, there is impaired brain function during the time of hypo. Is there any yes. evidence that that persists beyond the time of hypo? So the evidence comes from studies of kids. Um, basically, kids diagnosed with type 1 diabetes before the age of five who had recurrent severe hypo. And then there is evidence that um, there is a sign payment of performance over time. Evidence in adults is lacking um, because the, certainly the diabetes care and complication trial at, at 18 years follow up showed no obvious effect of hypoglycemia. Um, the problem is, of course, it's so hard to know because it takes years and years to show this sort of problem. And we're not talking about, we're talking about subtle changes over time. The question is whether it causes an acceleration, if you like, of the normal aging type process in different parts of the brain. So, you know, there's evidence in the elderly, there's evidence in young kids, but it's not strong, I have to say. And so I still, as a, as a clinician, I still advocate trying to get your control as good as it can be in the long term. I just, I mean, I know there is a risk of hypoglycemia. Nobody wants to minimize that risk and how important it is. But I still advocate, I still think on balance, the most important thing is good control. Um, and as you know, that's, that's a problem for us as a, as a whole in society. Yeah. Okay. Then someone brought up a, a kind of a link question, but a, a kind of a different side of this. Is, is there any evidence or should we be concerned about any mental health kind of concerns around the level of worry about hypo so i think that the question had probably in mind that the, the person that the, ch the child would type one but i guess the, you could also extend that to their carer as well so it does the amount of worry particularly about nighttime hypos any evidence that that is you know that that itself can be a kind of a mental health concern so i think it's a really interesting question for lots of reasons if you were to broadly characterize people, fear of hyperglycemia is causes worry actually in parents and carers more than it causes worry in people with type ones. Fear of hypo, hypoglycemia, I see in people whose HbA1Cs are 10% or 11%. Right, that's where I see it. I see it in people who run themselves high because they're so scared of hypoglycemia. And that's a, to me, it's a worry because then you're at huge risk of complications. Um, and it is a profound worry and very difficult to deal with. Where I tend to see behavior that drives sugar levels down a lot, that's fear of hyperglycemia. That's the ones who keep bolusing all the time whenever they get high. The other evidence is that with, I talked about the symptomatic response of hypo being, you know, um, one of the symptoms is anxiety. After repeated hyperglycemia, that seems to disappear. And the funny thing is, if you look, if you examine people with impaired awareness, actually they have no fear of hypoglycemia at all. Um, generally over time are, are very relaxed about the whole experience. So there doesn't, and people have argued, and it's a curious argument, I'm not sure I entirely believe in it, is that there is an element of addiction to it. Because if you look at the brain areas that are activated, you see that also in people who have problem for addiction. Now, I, I think that's very controversial. I'm not sure I believe that myself. I think what happens, though, is that there is reduced anxiety around hypoglycemia, and therefore people will just continue experiencing it and not worry too much. So it's a complex area, Chris, and I hope yeah. I'm getting that message across, but it's, it's, a really, it's, a, it's an area that we don't properly understand. But I think most of the anxiety comes from people who run themselves high and have a real fear of hypoglycemia. Okay. But then it's, you know, within families as a whole. I mean, if you've got a child who's having recurrent hypoglycemia, then of course that's going to cause anxiety and worry to you over time. Okay, thank you. No, that's, no, no, that's great. Um, so two, two last questions, uh, I think a simple one and a potentially more complicated one. So I think the simple one says, um, you talked a little bit about new insulins and somebody yeah. that is on MDI, but I think this probably applies to all of us, uh, questions about whether we should be kind of more actively updating 
the insulin that we're on as new insulins come out. So, yeah. so someone in particular on MDI and Levomir, should they be looking at new uh, uh, other insulins? But I think it's probably a general question for all of us. We're, we're used to kind of new kit that that beeps at us, but we don't potentially change our, our the insulin that we're we're on anywhere near as often as our pumps. So, should we so, be doing more active in that area? Yeah, yeah. My feeling is yes. Um, I, I mean, I think Levomir, for instance, is a twice a day insulin. Okay, and and that was the problem by the first generation analogs. Now that being said. If you came into my clinic on Levomir and short-acting insulin and an HbA1c of 53 or 48, uh, and you're not bothered by hypoglycemia, why would I change it? Um, uh, unless you're missing it, unless you're hypo a lot and you're not aware of it, that you've picked up on your flash glucose monitoring. But, you know, I think that for anyone else, I absolutely think you need to be updating onto the new and the better insulins. They have reduced glucose because they're, they're so much better. And, you know, I, I'm, when Traceba first came out, and, I, you know, I'm in uh, an adult clinic where only 14% um, of our population are on pumps, and the vast majority of people with type 1 are on injectors. And the difference was, was huge. I think people hadn't recognized that the, the difference between, say, Lantus and, say, Traceba or Trigeo. So, yes, I think you should. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're, we're kind of running out at the end of time, but I, there's 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 one more question I'd like to ask if if that's okay with you. So two people have, have, have kind of commented on the same thing from a different perspective. So one parent who's got a child with um, poor awareness, I suppose I would say, yeah. of, of of hypos, wanting to ask prospects for that changing as they get older, and then at the other end, Peter, who's who's I, who I know has been diagnosed for many men for several decades many many years talking about um the help that he had at a harp if I'm saying that right h-a-r-p course at down at king's yes um which helps yes. him personally with his hypo awareness so I suppose putting those two things together where should people go to get you know where, where are good places to go to get resources for that kind of for that kind of help beyond kind of the self help strategies that you've been talking about. Yeah, I, I think there are expert groups around. I mean, I, I think frankly it embarrasses me that I get so many referrals from other diabetes centres uh, for for unawareness where there are simple problems in, in insulin management. I, I think that for the child, I think it's so hard to, to for children because they're so active, they're so spontaneous. Um, and I think that if, if with hypoglycemia avoidance over time, you can begin to restore those symptoms, but it takes a long time. And I think what your uh, colleague Peter has discovered is that there is an aspect of that behavior that requires a cognitive behavioral approach. And the heart program, the Daphne Heart, are actually using those tools. Very few centers in the UK use it, actually. So King's is one, and that's done in an experimental setting. I think we should be adopting it more widely in the UK because I don't think it's just a matter of education. I think you've got to have very specific discussions around hypoglycemia avoidance, um, which require these type of cognitive behavioral therapies. Great, okay, thank you. You've, you've given us so much information, so much to think about, but also I think for those of us who maybe are parents with people with low awareness, also a lot of encouragement that there, there are strategies you know, both we can do in the home and, and look for help elsewhere. So Rory, really appreciate you taking the time on a, on a Sunday morning to, to, to help us with an area which I know many, many parents and, and people with type one are, are concerned about. So thank you for, 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 for a great presentation. No, it's a pleasure, Chris, it's a pleasure. Thank you, have a great, have a great um, session, current following on from this and a good day, everybody. Thank Bye you. Bye-bye now. Bye.